Hello, and welcome back. Picking up where we left off in our previous video, today we're going to be looking at Blender's user interface and viewport navigation techniques. We're also probably going to discuss a bit about the 3D grid, some of the axes that you'll find in the 3D world, as well as some techniques for getting oriented in Blender's 3D viewport. Now, before I kind of hop into this, I again am going to try to keep things short for the interest of time, but I would like to point out that uh, I found a resource that I think most of you will also benefit from. I will include the link in the video description as well as to my students to reference as well. But the nice thing that we have available to us is that the Blender Foundation themselves, the official Blender YouTube, has provided for us a playlist of 43 separate videos on Blender Fundamentals for version 2.8 and above. And you can see here that a lot of these videos are actually pretty short. Some of the longest only taking about 11 minutes. And they discuss things in a very compartmentalized fashion. And so if there's something specifically that you'd like to know in more depth, it seems that they go through all of these different things inside of Blender in some level of detail. Uh, which is great for me because as much as I like to, to teach people all of the fundamentals, I do think that it's very helpful that Blender has released a resource that is very professionally uh, recorded and has the information that people may need. So in our case, if you'd like to know more about viewport navigation or the overview of Blender's interface in general, feel free to follow the link in the description to find the Blender Fundamentals 2.8 playlist provided by Blender themselves and take a watch. Both of those videos are about 11 minutes each, which is about what I would expect to have some sort of an in-depth review of um, <clears throat> Blender's in interface or viewport navigation techniques. Um, and then for the rest of you who would like to know more of some of the techniques we'll be looking at in the future, we have some um, modeling introductions as well as creating meshes, discussing things like object and edit mode, which are the two modes that we'll be looking at when we dive into our exploration of Blender, um, mesh selection techniques, extruding, all of these are your basic standard workflow operations that you'll be dealing with on the regular. And so if you'd like to know more about those, definitely take a, a, a gander at what they have available to you and um, or available for you, I should say. And uh, yeah, definitely dive in here and find the specifics if you need them. There's some really great material here. Now, one thing that I can say is that from what I can see here, it doesn't look like they went through all of the um, user preferences inside of Blender, or at least the ones that we, we looked at in the previous video. So for those of you who need to review preferences for any reason, feel free to check out my previous video. I have also created a number of Blender videos for the previous version, 2.79. And so if you'd like to get an introduction to that and some, there are also some modeling videos relative to that, feel free to check out that content as well. A lot of that material still applies inside of Blender. It just so happens that some of the layout inside of 2.8 and later is a little bit different. So with that out of the way, let's kind of jump into our abbreviated version of Blender's user interface and navigation techniques. All right. so. Uh, let's kind of talk about what's happening on the screen in Blender just as it is. So this is, again, the, a fresh install of Blender. I haven't changed anything except for our basic preference customizations that we looked at in the previous video. And so we have a number of areas on the screen that we should probably look at. So at the very top of the screen, you have your file edit render menu. That's pretty standard for most pieces of creative software. And most of them will have things that can explain themselves. So use the tool tips or reference the documentation if you're curious about that. Or of course, as always, you can leave your questions and comments in the comment section down below. Um, but the, the next thing that we should talk about that's more specific to what we're looking for are the workspace settings. So those are these tabs across the top of the screen and these provide us with different workspaces in which we can do certain things. So for example, if we're trying to sculpt something with digital clay, there's a sculpting option and there is a little bit of setup that's required for this and we're not really going to be dipping into this for the, the purposes of this video because this gets a little more advanced and specific. And so just know that if you do want to sculpt with digital clay, there is an environment workspace for you to do that in. Um, now that said, any of these workspaces that we have available to us here, we can configure those in any other workspace. 
it's something that you should understand that um, there's nothing hidden in any of these workspaces that you can't access in any other one. They're just pre-configured layouts. And so you can configure any layout to be exactly how you want it once you know what it is that you're looking at. And so let's head back to the layout option here and take a look at what's happening on screen. Um, <clears throat> so you can see that each of these layouts or workspaces as they're called comes with separate types of configurations. And these configurations are found in windows known as editors. And the way that you can kind of identify an editor is this big gray bar across the top of each area. And it kind of lights up as you change from editor to editor. So you can see you've got this big editor here, then this one smaller one over here, another sort of smaller one here, and a really crunched one down here. And of course, as we kind of scale the user interface in the previous video, you'll get a little more screen real estate here and there. Uh, but this is more or less what you can expect out of opening Blender for the first time. Now let's discuss what sort of interface uh, editor types we have here. So the first one that we have here is this large one called the 3D viewport. And the way that I can identify that is that every editor will have a button in the upper left hand corner that we can hover over and it says editor type and then it will tell you the current type which happens to be 3D viewport and it will give you a short description of that editor. So in this case, it's somewhat helpful. It says manipulate objects in a 3D environment. And so here's our 3D environment where we will be manipulating our objects. Of course, it's pretty predictable. Now. The other types of editors do different things, of course, and this button, it, what's really nice about it is I can find all the different editor types and I can change to them. So for example, if I wanted to do some animation in this area and I want to switch to a timeline, there we go. We can change the whole window to a completely different editor type and work this way. Now, this is, may not be necessarily helpful because now you don't have a 3D scene to reference, but maybe we can turn this one over here into a 3D viewport, and all of a sudden now I have a small preview of my animation if I'm really focusing on what I'm doing in my timeline. And the timeline is similar to Adobe After Effects or Premiere, for example. You can create keyframes and you can you know, make all sorts of considerations for how to handle animation over time inside your timeline, of course. There are also other uh, editor types that allow you to play with the graph editor, which is something very similar to what you'll see inside of After Effects as well. Um, so there are a number of different sorts of editor types that are suited for various different needs. Now I'm going to reset this large editor back to the 3D viewport and this one back to the outliner, which is what it was originally. And so let's carry on. So this is obviously going to be our 3D viewport where all the action, all the magic happens. Then this next one over here is called the outliner. Now if we hover over this, it gives us, of course, the name outliner. And it will tell us that it's an overview of the scene graph and all available data blocks. Now, I find that that description is not the most helpful for new beginners who don't know what a scene graph or data blocks are, and that's okay. Um, essentially, for our purposes, what I want you to think of this as is a list of everything inside of our 3D scene. And so the 3D environment that we'll be dealing with most of the time is called a scene. And you can see that here, it says scene collection at the top of our outliner. And then the collection contains all of the items in our scene, of course, and the items that we have in the 3D viewport in our 3D scene are a camera. If I click on that, you'll see the cameras highlighted a cube, now the cube gets the highlight, and then a light, the light gets a highlight. And so you can see that we can select items inside of this list and keep track of them even if we can't visually see them inside of the 3D viewport. And so this is a really nice way of, of, of course, staying organized, of knowing where our things are, being able to track down stuff in our scene, even if we can't view them directly in the 3D viewport. So just think of it like that for now. And then as things get more complicated and we use this for different things, I'll make sure to call that out to you. You can also see that at the top of the window, I didn't really extend my explanation of this top bar to include these because I wanted to wait until we started to look at the scene collection and scenes in general with the outliner. But you can actually create and change your scenes up here at the top. And so there's this button here. You can see that our scene is currently called scene, which is the default scene name, go figure. Um, however, there is this button here uh, so we can rename it. So I can call this anything I want. And then we can click this button to create a new scene. So if I click that, 
you'll see it'll give us a pop-up for new we can also copy settings and link things I would just say do new for now and you'll see we have scene point zero zero one and it's got its own scene collection and it's empty because there's nothing in the scene now I'm gonna leave this one here because I want to show you something in the next editor that will become very important so just remember this is our outliner this is a list of objects that we have in our scene and the next one is called the properties editor and this is where we're going to find of course predictively properties and settings for various things inside of blender and so the first one is going to be a tool and workspace settings um, tab inside of the properties editor and then the next grouping and you can see that there's spaces in between and so before I kind of jump ahead the tool and workspace settings of course gives the settings for whatever tool we have selected in our toolbar so if I change this you'll see that this contextually will change to reflect whatever tool I have and give me some options now it's also worth noting that some of those options can also be found at the top of the 3d viewport so feel free to simply use these shortcuts over here instead of having to come to this menu um, and I generally don't use this unless I'm doing something more specific like sculpting for example you can see here that if I select the cube and move to sculpting you'll see that we have the cube and I have all these different tools on the side there's a whole lot of them and they do various different things and that's why I'm saying it gets a little more complicated and we're not going to look at this in depth for our short series here however you can see that if I hover over the active tool and workspace settings now I get a lot more settings to play with that may or may not necessarily fit well in the top bar over here as you can see so it may be easier and more organized to use this menu than it is to try to fish through all of these uh, drop downs and everything over here to try to find what it is you're looking for so again, when you're using more complex situations, it may be helpful to use this. However, when we're in layout mode and we're just doing 3D modeling and we have these simple selection and transformation tools here, uh, I tend not to reference this panel simply because it's really not that difficult to come up here and find what you're looking for. And to be honest, I really don't use a lot of these settings anyways. Um, so I'm not gonna go over them. Um, if you'd like to know more about some of these settings over here, simply hover your mouse over them or check the user documentation or any of the videos that may be available to you so I'm just gonna close that up and let, let's move along now you'll notice that there are these little separations in between the tab groupings here and these mean something so what we have this next collection of tabs and essentially what these settings are are relative to our scene and you can see here that we get the little scene icon that reflects this option up here and we get the name of our scene so if I were to switch this for example to scene 001 you can see that we have settings for scene 001 reflected and let's say for example that I switch our render engine which is going to be found in the render properties tab for our scene of course this will tell blender what engine you want to create your final image in when it comes time to, to do that and I can switch this to cycles um, which is the more quote-unquote realistic uh, render engine that's available inside of blender so I just changed some settings there and you can see that now if I switch back to scene you can see that in my original scene we're still using the old engine or the original engine I should say EEV is actually a newer rendering engine in blender than cycles uh, but essentially just know that these scene settings are going to be specific to whatever scene you're in and so as you switch back and forth you'll notice that this changes because it's storing all of these settings per scene now I created this just to show you this you, you don't have to do this at home to follow along to really know this but um, you know if you have done it that's okay uh, I'm going to delete the scene now just make sure that we're in the new scene which is called scene 001 and we're just going to press this X button to delete it now if you accidentally delete this scene that we're in right now you're going to lose all of your objects and so I would suggest that you open up a new instance of blender to get them all back that way you can follow along but we're not necessarily going to be going through all of these options right now in detail what I'm intending to do is when we get to the point where we create an image I will call out whatever settings I'm editing and make it known to you what we're doing at that time Again, if you'd like to know more, reference the user documentation or the online videos. Otherwise, wait along with you know, the videos and I will, of course, explain what it is that I'm changing when the time for that comes. But essentially, these are all settings relative to the scene that allow us to change the way that Blender interacts with it. So the first one is the render properties, so we can change how it chooses to create the render. These are the output properties, so creating images that have different resolutions or animations that may have a different frame rate, for example. You'll find those settings here. 
This is the render layer properties. So this is if you want to create composite images that have different layers. Again, that gets a little more complicated and we're not really going to be looking at those. We will take a look at these top two tabs very briefly at a later point, uh, but we won't really be worrying too much about this third one. It gets out of the scope of what we're trying to accomplish. And then we have our scene properties tab where there are a number of useful settings in here that we're not really going to go through too deeply. Um, the first one is the camera setup. So obviously we have a camera in our scene, which is here. We can also find it in the outliner. Uh, we need a camera in order to create our final image. And this is the viewpoint through which Blender will be looking when it goes to determine that final image and render it out to our screen. And then ultimately we can save that render as an image onto our computer and show off our lovely 3D modeling if we so choose, of course. But we must have a camera in the scene in order to render. Otherwise we can, of course, preview renders without cameras, but in order to create that final image output, we need a camera. Or you could also kind of brute force it and just take a screenshot of the preview if you really if you really want to do that. But of course, I would always suggest rendering it properly so that you have more control over your actual settings and the final output. Um, that said, to determine what camera is being used for the scene, we simply can drag and drop our camera here. It's already listed as it is, um, but if we have more than one camera, so for example, if I duplicate this camera, and for me, that would be Shift D, um, that same keyboard shortcut will work for you. Or you could go object and then you can find the duplicate objects, which again is listed as shift D, however you like to work. You'll notice that as we have two cameras, and so when I duplicated that, by the way, just as a note for later, when you duplicate something, it'll create a copy, but it'll be attached to your mouse. In order to unattach it to your mouse, if you want to move it to a new location, you can simply move it and click to accept the transformation or you can hit either escape and right click to cancel the movement. But now that duplicate, if I turn on my, my movement option here, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, now you can actually move it from its original location with some level of precision. Um, so just keep in mind that when you duplicate things, if you don't actually move it and accept the movement, which is a transformation, um, it will actually stack the object directly on top of the previous one. So just keep that in mind. I will call that out again as we apply that to 3D modeling and mesh objects, which is really important for us to keep in mind, uh, but you're getting your exposure to it for the first time here. Now note that I have three cameras in the scene and only one of them has a big black triangle over the top. The other two have the empty triangle over the top. Um, and so essentially what that means is that this is the active camera. Um, whereas these are inactive, they're not being used. Now I can of course change that. So here in our scene properties tab, I can drag this camera over here and you'll see that this one now inherits the dark triangle over the top and the other two are empty. Now, of course, I'm going to leave this as the default and I'm just going to select these two objects. So the way I can do that is I can grab my selection tool up here and I can drag select over the two or I can click one and shift click the other and have both selected as well. You'll notice that the active object is in the light yellow and the, um, the selected object is in the orange. And so there is a selection order to things inside of Blender that gets a little bit confusing if you kind of split it between the outliner and the 3D viewport. I'll show you what I mean right now. So when I select something, it turns active, which is this yellow color. And then if I shift select something, the next thing that I select in the 3D viewport becomes the active object. And the previous one becomes a selected object. And the reason why that this is important is because some operations are relative to the active object and whatever is shift selected as selected uh, will kind of follow around whatever you're doing here. Again, we'll look at that more in detail later on, but just know that this is a little bit different in the outliner. So in the viewport, whatever I select last will be active. In the outliner, whatever I select first will be active. So if I select this camera and then I shift select this one, you'll notice that this one turns orange and this one stays yellow. And that's just because of the way that the outliner is programmed to work. I'm not entirely sure why the Blender Foundation chose to make this decision. Just know that that's how it is. So if you're selecting objects in your outliner, be sure you know which one is the active one. It will be the first one that you click and anything that you shift select afterwards will only be selected, which is opposite of the viewport, which is whatever you select last will be active. So just keep that in mind. Now, if I want to delete these objects, I can say object and 
find delete. I can also press the delete key on my keyboard, not to be m mistaken with backspace, but the actual delete key, which is uh, below the insert key and to the left of the end key on my keyboard. Or the way that I prefer to do it is press the X key and say delete. And there we go, we've gotten rid of those objects. All right, so carrying back on with the properties editor, uh, we have some background scene and active clip options here. We're not gonna worry about those. And then the next settings that are useful for a lot of people are the unit settings. And so this is how we can kind of set our units up inside of Blender. This is basically the, uh, the basic metric by which we'll make measurements in our 3D scene. Um, there are some warnings that I will give about this, but essentially you can change between the metric and imperial system or to a none system. Um, the thing about kind of making measurements and scale in 3D is it's somewhat arbitrary. Um, however, that's not, not really true. Um, but for our purposes, the way I'd like you to think about it is you can set it. Um, the unit scale is set to one by default. So the basic default unit inside of Blender, this applies to the grid that we're seeing on screen here in the 3D viewport, is it's in meters, so it's metric. And one of these grid squares is one meter. So the cube that we have in our scene is, is two meters by two meters by two meters. So it's two meters wide, two meters tall, and two meters deep. Um, and you can see that if you actually measure it up next to the grid units here, you can see there's one meter there and then another meter here, therefore comprising two meters in dimension. Um, we'll look at more understand, uh, more of understanding um, mesh objects, qualities and measurements and things like this once we actually get into some 3D t terminology and modeling techniques, most likely in the next video. Uh, but essentially know that if you need to work in a specific measurement, you have those available to you here. The warning that I will deliver to you based on this is that Blender is a little strange in that if you're doing any simulation or any specific type of work um, that requires simulation or any measurement of units, it likes to do that in its native unit scale of one meter metric. Um, and so if you change this, um, you may have issues where some of your simulations break and things go awry. So it's often suggested that when working in Blender to keep everything at the base scene default, and then when you export your objects out, say for 3D printing or for even game engine use, to scale them either in that application that you'll use after Blender to make sure that everything inside of Blender remains copacetic. Um, so essentially, I would highly recommend that we leave everything here default and not mess with them. But just know for those of you more advanced users who are looking for specifics, you'll find those options inside of the scene properties unit tab. The rest of these options we're really not going to look at and so I'm going to ignore them. The last option that we have here deals with the world, which if you look at here in the viewport, you'll see that it's a gray background world. Now this grayness that we're seeing inside of this particular viewport is actually set in the preferences. So if I change this, nothing's gonna happen. Even in the uh, viewport display, I don't think that this will change anything in our background. Uh, we, we would have to go into edit and preferences and go to the themes option and then look for the background option in the 3D view, I believe, uh, which is probably gonna be found here. And then I think at the bottom, um, I don't want to really fish around for it, but I know that the settings are in there. I've changed them before. Um, but know that this background has to do with our render. So the final image that we create at the very end of our process has a world op uh, option for it. There, there are some things that we can do to shut off that background or just get the reflections from it. We can also put an image in so that it looks like there's a 3D world reflecting onto our scene. Again, a lot of that gets more complicated than what we're looking at for basic 3D modeling. So just know that if you do wanna edit world settings for our scene, you're gonna find them in this tab here. Now the next grouping of tabs, which I'm not gonna go through every single one of these because not all of them are relevant to us. I'll give us a basic overview of some of them. Uh, these are relative to whatever you've got selected inside of your 3D scene. So these are considered object properties. So this cube is considered an object, specifically a 3D mesh, and so it has its own properties. This camera is not a mesh necessarily. Uh, there is a mesh representation of it on the screen, but it's considered a camera, which is its own unique type of object, and therefore it has its own settings. So everything has object settings. You'll see in this first button here, um, or first tab here, we have object properties, and this gives us its location in 3D space, its rotation, and its scale. 
as well as a mode for rotations, but we're not really going to get into that. That's way more complicated than we need to worry about for this video. And then some delta transformations, which again get more complicated than we're worried about in this video. So just think of it as uh, transforms deal with where it is in space, how it's rotated or oriented, and what size it is, so what scale it is. And these, we're going to be looking at these settings um, in two places. So there's another side menu up here inside of the 3D viewport. You can toggle that open and closed with the N key or the sidebar button here under the view menu. You can also use this little arrow tool like I did and just click on it. Um, but you'll notice that if I pop this open and go under the item tab, I get similar settings here. I also get some dimensions. So with the cube selected, I can see its location, its rotation or orientation, and its scale, as well as the dimensions. And so like we mentioned, I said it was a two by two by two meter cube, and you can see that here. Now this dimension option that we're gonna look at has to deal with the bounds of the object. So if I created two cubes and joined them as one object, it's gonna look at the furthest points and use that to calculate its ultimate dimension. So um, if you don't really know what that means right now, it's okay, we'll take a brief look at it. Uh, but just know that if it's not a cube object that you're looking at, um, some of these dimensions may be wider than you're actually expecting for your object. So for example, if I created an object um, or add an object, I'm sorry, under mesh and, and grab the monkey, and I use my move tool to just move that out, you'll notice that the dimensions have some level of specificity to them, uh, but essentially it's looking at the outer bounds of this object and not necessarily measurements around the circumference of it. So just keep that in mind. Uh, these dimensions are a box that's being generated around it, and we can actually kind of visualize that. So with the monkey selected, I can go to viewport display, and I can turn on this bounds option and now you can see that we get this box around the monkey and these dimensions are actually describing that box there. So that's another setting that we can find in the object properties option here that, are, that can be pretty useful for us. There are a number of other settings here. Um, I'm not gonna dig too much into it right now. Um, if we do at a later point, I will of course call it out to you and we can go from there. In the meantime, I'm just gonna delete our monkey since we don't need it and then we'll return back to the cube for the rest of this demonstration. So here we have our object transformation properties, which again are reflected here. Now it's worth noting that we're going to explore two separate modes inside of Blender. Currently we're in object mode. We're gonna be doing a lot of our editing, go figure, in edit mode. And so this menu right here is gonna change depending on what we have selected inside of our 3D viewport. This menu over here will always be the same. This will always rep uh, reference object mode, essentially, or the object's transformation data. So I can give you a short preview of that. And if you need me to go slower, you can either slow the video down or rewatch it any number of times to help you understand. But essentially, if we switch from object mode to edit mode, you can see now that we get a lot more tools and then we have some other settings that are available to us here that were not available before. And now you can see that this transform menu has changed to a median. And the, what that median is referencing is it's taking an average of all these points right now that are selected. You can see that this cube is made up of these points, otherwise known as vertices, the singular being vertex. And those all have their own location in 3D space. And we can, of course, manipulate or transform that location according to this menu here. So if I were to select simply one of them, just by clicking on it, you can see that it changes to vertex and that vertex has a specific location and we can manipulate that. Now you'll notice that these are no longer the same and that's because this item menu is specifically referencing what we have selected on screen, whereas this transformation option is referencing the object's properties if we were to switch out to object mode and now you can see that these are both consistent so to give you an example of that disparity again i'll go into edit mode i'll select one vertex and i'll change its location so just remember it's negative one but i'll change its location and you can see that that stretches it out here and you'll notice that this doesn't move at all and that's because we haven't actually moved the object from where it's resting we've only changed a component of the object and its qualities. So now if I were to drag this, for example, you'll see the whole object will move. And if I were to switch out into object mode, you'll see that these are consistent. And that's where we get that value from.
So I'm just going to undo this for now by con hitting control Z until the cube goes back or I could go in and dial those settings back in. So this was at negative one, I could have just typed it in if I wanted to and then zeroed out my object location. Um, X option there, it's completely up to you how you'd like to work. Um, previously in Blender, there wasn't an uh, undo option so you would have had to type those values in. Now we have the undo option, which is of course much more usable and, and much more user friendly. So I'll switch back out into object mode. Um, and I will say that it is very important that we keep a track of what mode we're in. So anytime that I'm switching, I'll do my best to call it out to you, but you can always find out what mode I'm in by referencing this option up in the upper left hand corner. The way that you switch between modes on the fly, by the way, is the tab key. So before we get too much into modes and editing things, I know I gave you a little preview there. Um, just know that this is always going to reference object properties. So I'm going to hit the N key to close up the sidebar for now, and we'll continue with our explanation. Um, so we may look at transforma uh, transformations in the object uh, properties tab here, but that's probably going to be the majority of it. Again, we looked at a little bit of viewport display, but again, I'll call that out when it's necessary. The next one is a modifier tab. Now, modifiers are really powerful, non-destructive, um, well, modifiers. They're operations or effects that we can put on our objects in 3D space, and they're what's called procedural. So you'll see this word a lot inside of 3D, and essentially what procedural is referring to is instead of doing things manually or, you know, with a set of external data, you can actually have Blender do a lot of stuff for you using some clever math. And so, for example, if I were to add a modifier on, let's use the subdivision surface modifier, you'll see that it does things to our cube. Um, however, what, what's nice about this is I can toggle this on and off using this toggle button here to show the real-time modifier in the viewport. Um, I can actually toggle it on and off and you can see that we always have our cube still available to us. The other way that I could see that is if I switch to edit mode, you'll see that the cube is still there. Um, it gives you a preview of what the modifier is doing, but the cube is still ultimately there with all of its vertices like we looked at before. So I'll just switch back out into object mode. So the nice thing about this is I can do a whole lot of operations to this cube and I can still save the cube or I could edit the cubes underlying structure and then have these modifiers apply to it later to do various things. Now we're not gonna get too exhaustive with modifier use. Obviously there is a very large amount of uses for modifiers that are potentially limitless. And uh, there are a number of really nice tutorials out there for non-destructive modeling workflows and things like this. But before we can get a real appreciation for that sort of workflow, we should probably have an understanding of the traditional style of modeling. And so we'll continue talking about how we do things manually inside of Blender to get a command of things. And then later we can supplement with these modifiers to really power up our workflow. So for now, I'm just going to hit the X button to delete that modifier and you'll see that our cube returns completely back to normal. The next few settings are not really relevant to us. So these are particle and um, physics and constraint settings. Um, this is going to be more for animation and simulation type stuff. So we're going to kind of gloss over those and not really talk about them right now. The next setting is a really in detail setting. So this is called object data properties, not to be confused with object properties. Um, so this is dealing with the object as it exists in 3D space. So the object mode version, quote unquote. And then this is going to be dealing with specifics about the object. So this can be more akin to edit mode. And you'll see these icons actually kind of, if we were to twirl open the cube, you'll see that this is the object of the cube. But if I click on this setting here with this icon that reflects the object data properties, you'll see that we enter into edit mode. So this is a good way to kind of forge that mental association. Now you'll note that when I click back onto the object, it's not going to send me back to object mode. Um, so just keep that in mind. You need to manually switch that. But essentially, if we click here, it will switch us into edit mode and we can kind of see more of the object properties relative to what's going on here. So let's go back into object mode just to stay there because we can still view these object data properties even in object mode. Just know that if you click the icon here under the twirl down for the object of the cube, you're gonna end up in edit mode. So again, keep close attention to what mode you're in and what you're doing. Otherwise, it's easy to be overwhelmed or to kind of lose your place inside of 3D. Um, so essentially what this is, is it's talking about the 
the components that comprise the object. So like I mentioned before, this cube is made up of a series of vertices, um, eight vertices to be exact. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, the, the sixth one is hidden, seven and eight are the eight points that are connected together with edges that form the polygons or faces of our cube. And we'll talk more about these sub-object components, as I call them, um, when we start to dig into edit mode. But just know that this object data properties panel deals with a lot of those settings. So we can create groups of vertices or vertex groups as they're called here. And we can assign various vertices to certain groups and then do things based on that group selection. So that gets a little more complicated and we're not really going to be looking at any of that for this tutorial, but I think it's important that I mention it for those of you who would like to continue on with your 3D learning. UV maps are also another complicated subject that I'm not really going to be getting into too much in this tutorial. Um, there may be a video later where I give you somewhat of a simplified version of what that means, so keep an eye out for that. Vertex colors are similar to vertex groups. Face maps are mappings of faces, and so we're not really gonna deal with that. Um, I tend to, to work with vertex groups for certain things. Um, face maps can become useful for various other things that are, again, more complicated than what we're doing here. And then normals. So normals are the way that Blender wants to shade 3D objects. Now this is a subject that gets a little confusing for new users who've never seen it before. But essentially, if I have this cube selected in the 3D scene, um, if I right, uh, right click it, I'll get this object context menu and we have two different shading modes. We have flat shading, which is what it is by default. So nothing's gonna change if I select that. However, I have shade smooth, where if I click that, you'll see that the cube changes the way that it's presented. Now, I'm not going to explain exactly what this means right now, simply because it's again out of the scope and this will be very important for people who are looking to get into 3d modeling and want to do things like create game assets or something like this i mean it's really important for everyone who's doing 3d modeling to be cognizant of um, but it is something that i think comes up maybe a little bit more inside of game 3d game modeling or game asset modeling uh, but essentially it's basically changing the way that blender wants to display this information to the user um, and so currently it's displaying in a weird way because we set it to smooth. Now a cube obviously isn't smooth like a sphere. And so this isn't gonna make a lot of sense or be very useful to us. Um, and that's where this option for normals auto smooth comes in. If I turn this on, you'll see it goes back to normal and it has an angle value. So again, I'm not gonna dig too deeply into this because it's a little more advanced. Keep an eye out for a future video if you're really interested in this or check out some of the resources online. Just know that this is going to change the way that Blender is going to present your objects to you. So I'm gonna switch this back to Shade Flat for now. Um, later when I do some basic operations with this, um, we'll look at it and I'll explain it. Um, at least in terms of what we need to do for our purposes. So I'll close that out. The rest of these options we're not really gonna look at. There's a nice remesh setting in here, but again, uh, this kind of falls out of scope for what we're looking for. The last setting that we have here in the object specific properties inside of our property editor is material settings. So again, this kind of falls just, just a little bit outside of the realm of 3D modeling uh, because now this is more look dev, texture and material design, which is basically, those are like two or three um, separate job descriptions in and of themselves if you want to work professionally in the 3D industry, generally speaking. Um, that's not always the case, of course. Those who work in more generalist positions, maybe at smaller companies, or, you know, um, nowadays people are getting more versatile and wearing more hats. So it's not uncommon, of course, to find a 3D modeler that knows this, and they should know it in all honesty. Uh, but specifically, if you're working in the 3D industry, at larger companies, they're going to separate the roles out between someone who does material design and 3D design. So useful tidbit about the industry there for those of you who want to know. Uh, but essentially, this deals with, again, how Blender shows the user uh, or displays its um, recreation of realistic world surfaces, essentially. 
Um, that's not the best description of it, but essentially these are procedures for how Blender can start to mimic realistic surfaces. It's got a specific um, surface algorithm. I'm not sure if it's an algorithm, maybe that's not the right word, but it's got a, a, a procedure for creating a surface called principled BSDF. As an artist, I never memorize what BSDF means. Um, but it's, it's again, a, it's a complicated procedure that's doing math to create realistic surfaces, essentially. And so we have a bunch of other procedures here and some qualities that we can change about how we want our object surface to present when we create the final image. So again, it falls out of the scope for this video, um, but I will more than likely touch on it very briefly. And when I do, I will explain what I'm doing and how it relates to us as designers or artists. And then in the future, I may talk about some more complicated setups in later videos or series. So just keep in mind that if you want to change the way that your object looks in the 3D scene or the 3D world when you go to render it, you're probably going to do that with a material here in this tab. The last setting that we have is kind of a Blender internal setting. So um, it's not really tied to any object specifically. This is creating a data type of its own. And this is the texture properties menu. So when we create textures inside of Blender or we import them, we can deal with them in this menu if we so choose. Uh, there are other places that we can do that as well. Just know that, that Blender gives you an option there. And we're not really going to be dealing with that for the scope of this video. So now that I've explained basically all of the settings, inside of this property uh, editor. Let's talk about the one at the bottom. So the one at the bottom is of course a timeline. I mentioned it briefly before. Uh, we're not dealing with animation, so we're just not gonna use it. And so as a result, I would like us to work in the modeling tab since modeling is what we're going to do. So with the cube selected, make sure you don't have any of these other elements selected, select the cube and let's move to modeling. Now you'll notice that once when we have a mesh object selected and we click the modeling tab, it will actually switch us over to edit mode. And so that's why I wanted you to have the cube selected is so I could make a point of be sure to pay attention to what mode you're in. Sometimes based on what you have selected in your scene, when you click one of these options for a different workspace, it will change your mode based on that workspace. So for our purposes, we're just going to go back to object mode. And I just want to make an extra point of that just so that we're aware of what mode that we're in. Now, moving forward, I'm actually going to turn on a helpful tool called screencast keys, which will display in the lower left hand corner everything that I'm clicking so that you can better follow along with me. And then I'm just going to close that side menu bar. So now that we've discussed Blender's basic user interface, you can see here that we've gotten rid of the timeline by going to the modeling workspace layout. I want to show you how to configure windows very briefly. So you can actually create separate areas or windows as I call them for places um, to create editors. So for example, every editor has four corners and they're rounded. And then in between the editors, you'll have a darker line, typically depending on the uh, layout you have, so or a theme that you have. So for my theme, it's the dark theme. And you can see here we have these separations in between. And if I hover those on those separations with my mouse, my cursor will change. And so I get this double headed arrow cursor. If I click and drag that, you can see that I can actually reconfigure the size of my editors and customize them however I see fit. So maybe I want more room for my outliner. I can simply hover over the border between the outliner and the properties editor, and I can move that. So get used to that. And then the next thing gets a little more complicated. So let's say that I want to move my outliner and my properties editor to the left side of the screen. Well, like I mentioned, every editor has four corners. And if I hover over any one of those four corners, my cursor will turn into a crosshair. And if I click and drag that crosshair, I can actually open up a new editor and it will be the same type of editor as the one that I dragged out on. And you can see here that we have two 3D viewport editors. Now, the nice thing about this is that if I want to change this to an outliner, I can simply find the button for the editor type and switch it to an outliner. And there you go. I've got the outliner on the left side, which is my list. And then I've got my 3D viewport. And then, of course, the two windows on the right side. Now, if I wanted to recreate the properties editor at the bottom, I can simply find the bottom corner or the top corner. Really, it can do it either way of this uh, outliner. And I can click and drag and create a new um, 
editor there. And then I can switch this one to properties. And there we go, I've recreated this menu on the right, on the left. So you can really configure Blender in any number of ways that you want, however it's most useful to you. Sometimes I'll see people using two 3D viewports so they can kind of preview the final render in one window and then work in the larger window. Um, sometimes it's useful to be able to see your object from multiple viewpoints. And so having multiple 3D windows or 3D uh, editors can be really helpful for that. So just keep in mind, Blender is highly configurable. So now that I've showed you how to create new editors, let's show you how to collapse them. It's kind of important. So you can see here that we have divisions between some of these editors. And one of the things that people end up doing that kind of make a mess of things is they'll create a whole bunch of editors like this, and they won't really know how to close it. So let me show you that now. One way that we can close an editor or collapse an editor is to hover between the separation in the window and to right click and then we have options for joining areas. We can also swap them. So if we've got two separate editors, for example, I'll show you up here and I just didn't click anything there. I just left the menu and it closed on its own. I can right click here and I can say swap areas and you'll see the flip. So this becomes a 3D viewport and this becomes the outliner. So I'll just do that again. So hover there in between and hit swap areas and you can see it swaps. So now let's figure out how to collapse them. So if I right click, I can say join areas. And if I click that, you'll see I get a little arrow icon. So where the arrow is pointing is where it'll collapse. So what, what's gonna happen if I click right now is that the, the lower editor, the 3D viewport is actually going to collapse over the top of the outliner. And so this is a way to control it. I can also choose to collapse the outliner down over the 3D viewport. So let's do that. And I'll simply click. If I want to cancel that, I can either right click or hit the escape button, by the way. Now, the other way to do this is to find a corner from the one that you want to collapse and click it and drag. And you'll see that you'll get the same little arrow icon and the arrow overlay. And if you let go, it'll collapse. So that's one way to do it. Now, there is one sort of warning that I have to give you about this, and that is if you've got a number of outliner or editors that are stacked on top of each other like this, you can't take a big one and collapse it over. And you'll see that I, I get this kind of no good operation, this little strike uh, circle with a, a slash through it that explains to me that I can't actually do this. And the reason for this is because uh, Blender doesn't know what editor to preserve here or which one to get rid of, or if, it don't, if you only want to get rid of two, but not the third. And so it kind of creates a problem in, in Blender's understanding of its editor layout. And so what we need to do is resolve all of these first by collapsing them down, and then we can collapse over the top of this one. And now we, you can see I've returned back to the default modeling layout that we had when we first switched over. So just keep in mind, um, like I said, you can configure Blender however you need it to be and it can get rather complicated. So make sure that you're keeping track of your editors. Again, pay attention to this large dark header here that will change as you highlight over editors. And it's also worth noting that I should make mention here that some of the shortcuts and key options that you have available to you will only work in certain, inside of certain editors. So each of these editors have their own shortcuts that work for it. Um, and so make sure that you're contextually in the right editor before you try to use any hotkeys or shortcuts. Otherwise, you can run into problems where unexpected behavior arises. So make sure you know which editor you're in and, and uh, you, know, you can go from there. All right, so now that we've gone over customizing the layout in the workspace, uh, let's talk a bit about understanding the 3D viewport because I think that's an important thing. Uh, however, I do think we've kind of run over time for this video, so I'm going to cut it short here. And in the next video, we'll talk about uh, 3D navigation techniques. So I apologize. I know I introduced this video as a uh, UI and navigation video, but the next one will be navigation. I'll be sure to label those appropriately. I hope that you found this helpful. Um, if you think that other people would find it helpful as well, feel free to share the video with them. That would also be very helpful to me. Um, I would also appreciate it if you like and subscribe. I have plenty more content planned to release in the future. And of course, I'm interested in getting into the specifics of how to create certain objects, how to do things like rigging and animation and stuff like that, which is a lot more complicated than what we're dealing with here. So keep an eye out for those in the future. Um, I'd like to thank you for watching this far into the video. I know it's been a lot of content. Again, if you've got questions or comments, leave them in the comment section down below and I'll be happy to answer you. 
uh, to the best of my ability. And again, thanks so much for watching. Please stay safe out there. Take care of yourselves. I hope you have a great day and I will catch you in the next video.